Good morning. <clears throat> We're going to begin today with the Hakdoma of the Ramban, the introduction of the Ramban to the Torah. And then we're going to move on, hopefully today, to begin the first Pasuk, Gracious for Kim. I don't know if I mentioned this uh, when we first started the, the Chumash, the Bereshish year. <clears throat> Ravol being a Sefer Ali Shur, in the introduction to the uh, Ali Shur, in one of the earlier sections of the Ali Shur, he talks about what a Ben Taira needs to learn so that he has foundational knowledge of Emuna. And one of the things that Rav Obi writes is that a person to have foundations in Emuna needs to learn Chamisha Chum Taira with Rashi and Ramban. And he emphasizes Ramban and many other Svarim talk about some cipher. Paisek some Saif in his time in a Shuva wrote about the foundational knowledge of basic emuna and bitochen that comes out of learning the Ramban al Hatayra. So we're going to finish the Lineda today, the Ramban's Hakdoma, and we're going to go to some Rashi, and then we're going to go, we answer Shem, to today's Shir in Rav Kook. Okay, so there was a scan that was sent out to maybe two weeks ago for the Ramban, the Hakdomas Haramban Al Hatayra. I'm going to go back to re learning that page. And it is Daf Hey. This is what was sent out. It looks like this the Hakdomas Haramban. And we're going to be starting on Daf Hey. Okay, we're starting right here at this paragraph. The paragraph says, Ode. Yesh biyadeinu. If you don't have the scan, but you have a chamisha chum sheitayr in your house with Ramban in it, as most every makros kedos I believe has Ramban in it, it would be the hakdamas haramban in your makros kedolos, the paragraph that begins od yesh biyadeinu. So Ramban says what we learned last week was that the whole the because the Torah is the blueprint of the entire universe. So everything is in the Torah either explicitly, expressly, or it's their Bederach Remes, which means that a person like Moshe Rabbeinu, who has taught all the secrets of the Torah, to the extent the human being can reach that level. Remember, we talked about the 50 Shari Bina and Moshe Rabbeinu, the Gemara tells us, received 49 Shari Bina, received elevated himself, yet 49 Shari Bina, the 50th, no one can be Zaycha to according to the Ramban, the 50th is understanding the essence of God, which nobody will reach, but because Moshe Rabbeinu had these 49 Shari Bina, and each one of these pathways or gateways to Bina deals with some other subject. One deals with plant life, one deals with animal life, one deals with the fish, one deals with the birds, one deals with human beings, etc. And therefore, because all of this is in the Torah, because if it's not in the Torah, it's not in the universe. The whole universe has its blueprint, its diagram in the Torah. Some of it we can see, some of it greater people can see, and some of it Greater people can see more than greater people who are somewhat below that. Moshe Rabbeinu saw all this in the Torah, the Bar Shalom taught it him. So if a person came to Moshe Rabbeinu and said, my uh, zebra is not feeling well, what should I do? Moshe Rabbeinu would tell you exactly what to do. Uh, come to Moshe Rabbeinu and say, my potted tulip plant is not doing well, what do I do? He'll tell you what to do. Moshe Rabbeinu knew the whole chachma of the Bria to the extent the human being can understand it. Therefore, he knew what it takes to make a particular thing healthy. Chas v'shom, what would make it sick? Chas v'shom, what can make it die? Chas, uh, what can heal it, etc. You know, all this chachma through the Torah because it's all in the Torah. When we say, for example, that HaKadosh Baruch who created the world in Asar Mamoris, which we're going to be learning about. Vayomer lekim yehi or, vayomer lekim yehi rakia. God said the word vayomer ten times. Actually, the Gemara asks, if you look in the parsha, from vayomer lekim yehi or until vayachulu, vayomer appears only nine times, not ten. 
And the Gemara says the word Bereshis, Nami Maimahu. The word Bereshis is also a word of creation. But the Rabbon Shalom, through the Vayomers, created the world that we call the world, the natural world. Although we try to refrain from using nature because of the Ramban we've spoken about many times at the end of Pasha's Bo, because nature is just some kind of a sanitized version of saying God. Mother Nature the, the caused the plant to come out. Mother Nature caused the apples to grow. There's no Mother Nature. It's all God, but God sometimes reveals himself in a way that we say, wow, this is unbelievable. I can see God. We call that a nest. And sometimes an apple grows off an apple tree and we don't necessarily think about God. We say, oh, it's the nature of putting an apple seed in the ground and a tree comes out and apples grow and I can make and I can eat the apple. Okay, that's just a normal thing. Well, there's nothing normal about putting a little tiny seed in the ground and then rain coming upon it and this huge tree coming out with apples coming out that you can actually eat. There's nothing um, rational or understandable about it, except that science can explain to you why this happened. Once science can explain to you why this happened, we call it Teva, sort of nature. Something that science can't explain, it's beyond science, like Kriya Syam, so if we say that's a nest. But in truth, the apple growing on a tree is also a nest. The Ramban in the Torah calls Nes Nister, a hidden miracle where God, seen, where God is operating undercover, so to speak. And then there's the Nes Nigla, where everybody can see God is controlling the world. So the, uh, Moshe Rabbeinu understood through the Rabbon Shalom teaching him the whole Torah, all of the Bria. He understood what makes things work, what makes things break, how do you fix everything, how do you heal things. He understood this from the Torah. The paragraph that I skipped in the Ramban, the Ramban talks about Shalom HaMelech. Shlomo HaMelech acquired this Chachma as well. He was the wisest man. He'll never be as he never was the Navi of Moshe. The, the Rambam says that um, at the end of Hilchas Shuba, when he's talking about Mashiach, that Mashiach is going to be a person who is going to be a Chacham, almost as great as Shlomo, but not a Navi as great as Moshe. Nobody can ever meet the level of Moshe in the Vur. Like, come Navi, I come Moshe. In Chachma, Melech HaMashiach is going to be a Chacham Kishlomo. Where did Shlomo get his Chachma from? He got his Chachma from the Torah. He saw it in the Torah. Now, the Ramban, going up a few lines, we're on page Hey of the Ramban, right here. It's before the paragraph, O Yesh Biodeno, right before that paragraph. But in that column, the Ramban says, "Pekach Omro Chazal tell us Afilu Palpulin Yita or not a Shlomo be'Eretz Yisrael." Shlomo Melech knew how to plant a certain kind of pepper that needs a certain kind of climate, and that climate is not exactly here in Eretz Yisrael, and therefore this kind of pepper can't grow well in Eretz Yisrael. Shlomo Melech knew how to make that pepper grow in Eretz Yisrael. How do you do that? How did he plant them in Eretz Yisrael? Shlomo was a great Chacham, and he knew how to use the foundation of the world. This is a Medrash, but it's also Gemara in Yuma. Lama Nikris Evan Shasia. Why is that rock that's on the Har Habayas called the Evan Shasia? What does Evan Shasia mean? It doesn't mean you drink from it. What does Shasia mean? Shemimenu Nishas Ha'olam. It is from there, according to some of Arshan, the word Nishas comes from the word Shesi. When you're weaving, there's an Ariv and a Shesi. There are threads that are going in two different directions, horizontal and vertical, and that's how you weave. 
I don't, I don't remember offhand which is the vertical and which is the horizontal, but one of the two is called the chassis. The Evan Shasia is called the Evan Shasia because that is the place from where God started weaving the world. As I give the marshal <clears throat> many times, my mother, Allah Shalom, um, was a professional before these things became marketable. She was a professional at making kipot sugo. She used to make me kipot sugo when I was a child growing up. I went to a very Haredi elementary school, Yeshiva Eastern Parkway. And the Yeshiva Eastern Parkway, you're allowed to wear any couple you want, a black couple, a knit couple, a kippah suga, with designs in it, without designs in it. There wasn't, uh, there wasn't um, an identity of some kind that polarized people. So my mother, Lea was a wonder at making many things, but she was a wonder at making kippot sugo. And I, want, I used to watch her sometimes how she made it. And the kippah suga started, there was a, like a long metal, looked like a, looked like a little hook. There was a little hook at the end of it. And she started at the, and she made like the start of the kippah. And it was like a little circle. And then the kippah would go round and round and round and round and round. And we'll finish, she would nod it. So <clears throat> the Evan Shasia is the place from which God started the whole world. It is around, that's the starting point of the world. It is around there that God created the rest of the world. So therefore, the Evan Shasia is the foundational stone from which everything else uh, be, was created around it. So therefore, <coughs> that's the Gemara. The Gemara in Yuma says that's why it's called Evan Shasia. Sherimenu nishsas olam. Vahaya, the Ramban says, Vahyashlomi yodeh eze gitchu holech lekush. Shlomo Melech knew that if the Evan Shasia is the foundation of the world, it is from there that the rest of the world was created around it. That means that the Evan Shasia in it, underneath it, around it, has the root of everything that's going around in the world. It is the foundation of everything. If it's not in the source, it can't be in the, thank you, Shesi is vertical. It is not in the, um, if it's not in the source material, it's not gonna be in the fruit. So if somewhere in the world, in particular, Kush, the land of Kush, north of Eretz Yisrael, in that land of Kush, they grew this kind of palpalum. They grew this kind of pepper. How did they grow this kind of pepper there? Because there was a kid, there was like a vein that went under the Evan Shasia, underground, all the way to Kush. And in Kush, it blossomed. And therefore, in Kush, they were able to grow these kind of palpalum, these kind of peppers. Shlomo Melech, who knew all this chachma of creation, he was able to uncover where exactly this root that's coming from the Evan Shasia is going underneath Eretz Yisrael and is heading out towards Kush. Shlomo Melech knew exactly where the Gid was, this uh, vein, so to speak, and he knew exactly where to plant uh, palpalin seed, this kind of pepper seed. So he opened the ground and <clears throat> knew exactly <clears throat> which vein was this particular pepper uh, vein, and he planted this kind of pepper seed on the vein, and now we have these kind of peppers growing in Eretz Yisrael. That was the level of Chochmah that Shlomo Melech had about the Bria, and he understood Evan Shasia, and he understood how the whole world was created around the Evan Shasia and knew how to use that Chochmah even to grow peppers that normally wouldn't grow, quote unquote, by the rules of Teva, would not grow in Eretz Yisrael. He knew how to do it. Okay. Next paragraph in the Ramban. We additionally have another Kabbalah of Emes. We have a Messiah that's true. First, the Ramban told us that in the Torah, there is letters that are upside down, there are letters that are small, there are letters that are big. We learned about this last week. 
And all these letters, big, small, upside down, backwards, are there because they form the blueprint of the world. <clears throat> Moshe Rabbeinu knew what the effect is. As, uh, we all know that upside down nun, for example, in Pasha's Baloska, that's in the blueprint of the world. The whole Torah is the blueprint of the world. So for example, if an architect draws a blueprint and in the blueprint, he shows something in the diagram, he shows something that's upside down. So you ask the architect, why is this thing upside down? What are you trying to indicate in the building that you put this thing upside down? And either he made a mistake or he'll tell you there's a reason it's upside down here because X, Y, Z. When the Rabbon Shalom told Moshe Rabbeinu to make a letter small, to make a letter big, to make a letter upside down, to make the letter backwards, it's because those letters are going to impact how the world was created, how the world will be run. And Moshe Rabbeinu understood these things. That's what we learned about last week, how every letter in the Torah is part of a greater blueprint of the world. And once you understand every letter and why some are small and some are big and some are upside down and some are backwards, you understand the implications of each of these letters on creation and on how the world operates. Now the Ramban is saying we have a second couple, a second uh, Mesorah on the letters of the Torah. The whole Torah is actually God's name. The letters, the way we have the letters in our Torah is not the only way the Torah can be written. Everybody just stay patient. The Ramban's going to explain, explain what he means. And this is not something the Ramban's making up. This is a Kabbalah that they have. Um, it's a Kabbalah that he has. And it's also brought down uh, in Kabbalah, in uh, Kabbalah's form. I'll give you an example, the Ramban says. It says the first the first few words are Bereshis in the beginning, Bora created Elohim God. So Ramban says that those three words, when you combine the letters, instead of Bereshis, you can leave off the Yudnasaf. So it says Barosh, the head which means it's referring to God. You take the Yud Nesof of the end of Bereshus and you add it to the next word, Bara, Yisbara, the creator. Next word, Elohim. So by rearranging the Yud Nesof, by taking the Yud and the Sof from the end of Bereshus and adding the Yud and the Sof to the beginning of the word, Bara, you now have Barosh, Yisbara, Elohim. Each of those words is referring to God. And therefore, the whole Torah, the letters can be rearranged, that every word in the Torah is a reference to God. Rabbeinu Shlomo, the Ramban's quoting here, Rabbeinu Shlomo, Rabbos Rabbeinu Shlomo is who? It's Rashi, Rabbeinu Shlomo Yitzchaki. The Ramban is quoting Rashi that the Ramban saw. He was learning Rashi. He quotes Rashi. And the Ramban is now quoting a Rashi in Gemara. The Gemara in Sukkah, and Afmem He Amen Aleph, talks about Ani Vaho or Ani Vahu, which we talked about before Sukkah, so Ani Vahu Hoshiana, the Gematria of Ani Vahu, Ona Hashem. And there Rashi discusses God's name. And Rashi explains where we get God's name, that holy name of 72 letters. And Rashi explains where we get it from. Rashi explains that there's three psukim in Pasha's Peshalach before Kriyas Yamsuf, three psukim one after another. You take the first letter of the first Pasuk, the middle letter of the second Pasuk, the last letter of the third Pasuk, some kind of combination. And you keep on doing these three letters first, middle, last, the second, the next one, the next to the last. You keep on doing this over and over and over, and you're going to get God's name of 72 letters. It's Kabbalah. Rashi talks about it. But you see from here the Ramban proves 
that God's name of seven, that's made up from, of 72 letters, is there in the Torah. Now, if you look through the whole Torah and you read it, you don't see a name of 72. But if you understand in Pasha's Bishala, before Kriyas Yamsuf, there are three psukim, and the way you arrange the letters in those three psukim, you have God's name of 72. That's just an example of the things that are in the Torah that you need a special set of eyeballs to be able to see. So the Rambani is just quoting the, the Rashi in Sukkim M. Hey, Shloshe Psuki Vayisa Vayova Vayet, Mubneze, and the Ramban now explains because of this, what just happened here. I just showed you, the Ramban says, that in these three Psukim in Peshalach, every letter is used and combines to form God's name of 72 letters. Now, what happens if one of those three psukim is missing a letter in the Sefer Torah? People always have this question. I have a whole Sefer Torah. The Sefer forgot one letter. The Sefer added one letter. One letter is not perfect. Ma mishane already. What is the big difference? The Balkaira read the letter. The Balkaira read the word right. We all know what it says. What's the difference if there's a letter missing or the letter's cracked? or there's an extra letter. What is the Mamish Aned, the Valkyrie read it, right? We all know what it means, and we all know what the word given by God was in this place. Mamish Aned, there's a mistake. So Ramban said, Nezeh, because of this, Seif B'Torah Shetor Bo Bois Achas Bumoli Oibachos Apostle. Now you can understand why if a Seif B'Torah is missing a letter, has an extra letter, or there's a problem with a letter, the Seif B'Torah is gonna be possible. why? So let's take an example we just spoke about. Three psukim in Parshas Peshala before Kriyas Yamsa. You would never know it. You would not know that God's name of 72 letters is in these three psukim. You would not see that with your regular eyeballs, need those special eyeballs. But it's in there. Moshe knew it, Shlomo knew it, Rashi knew it, many people between them knew it. If there's a letter missing in one of those three psukim, that means there's a letter missing from God's name. So we understand that if in a Sefer Torah, where it's supposed to say Yud Hey Vav K, one of the letters is missing. So a person is not going to have the chutzpah to say Ma Mishane. I know that it's supposed to be Yud Hey Vav K. Or you come to a place in the Sefer Torah and you say it says Aleph Lamed Yud Hey, and it's missing the Mem Sofit. Ma Mishane. I know it says Elokim or the lamed is broken. A person would be, it would be hard for a person to say, it's God's name. You're missing a letter of God's name. Whether you know that it says God's name or not, I need to see God's name in the title where God said, put my name in the title. There are all places in the title where God put his name where your eyeballs may not see it. Therefore, the Ramban says, in Kola Torah Kula, the whole Torah, a letter missing, a letter broken, a letter extra, the whole Sefer Torah is possible because you're messing around with God's name. The whole Torah is made up of God's names. Barash is Bora Elohim, the Ramban just told us, could be Barosh Yisbara Elohim. Every one of those letters can be used to form God's name. So if one of those letters is missing, you're missing one of God's names in the Torah. Therefore, the Sefer Torah is possible. The Sefer Torah is not possible because the word is missing a letter. The Sefer Torah is possible because by missing a letter, there's a letter missing from God's name. That's a Shrek. When, a, when, a, when you look at the Sefer Torah, you say, oh, the Sefer Torah is missing a letter. Okay. I know what the word is. The Sefer Torah is missing God's name. It's a different Shrek. So when we talk about there's an extra letter, a missing letter, a broken letter, it's not that there's something problem with the letter or with the word. It means that one of God's names has not been written properly in the Sefer title. That's what happens when a letter is missing or extra in the title. Kizeha Inyan, the Ramban says, because of what I just explained to you about the significance of every letter in the Torah and every word in the Torah, which in one combination or another spells God's name. <laughs> when you 
או שיכתב הוואג באחד משאר החסרים וכן כיועצה בזה. אף על פי שאין המעלה ולא ימיירת כפי העולה במחשבה. And for this reason, a sanctuary that's missing a vav, or has an extra vav, which you would think should not make a big difference, the Ramban says makes all the difference in the world because we're not talking about a missing letter to a word, we're talking about a missing letter to God's name because every word in the Torah is a combination, one way or another, of letters that make up Hashem's name. וזהו עניין שהביא גדול לי המקרא לימלס קלמולי בכל חוסר וכל התורה והמקרא לך בישראל במסורת עד עזרא הספר הנובי שנשתלנו בזה כמו שדור שמפוסק ויקרו בספר תורה סלוקים מפורש ושמסכל ובינו במקרא. And it's for this reason that the greatest of our men in the early generations counted, they, were, they wrote svarim, how many times is there an extra vav in the Torah? How many times is there a missing vav in the Torah? They wrote these things down. The Ramban uses an example, Ezra HaSofer. If you look in the Gemara in Kedushan and Aflamid, the Gemara talks about a sofer. We talk a sofer is a scribe. Sofer also means lispar, sviras haomer, to count. These were great men who counted. They counted every letter in the Torah, every place where a letter was missing. How many places is there above missing? How many places there above extra? And they counted these things and they noted these things. Ezra the scribe is also Ezra the counter. And the early generations, we have references to great men who are called ciphering. Not because they were scribes, they were counters. They were very makbit on every letter in the Torah because they had the understanding that every letter is one way or another part of a combination of Hashem's name. The Torah that Moshe Rabbeinu saw in Shemayim, which the Ramban taught us about last week or the week before, it was Eish Shechor Agabi Eish Levana. The Pasuk in Hazinu says that the Torah was Eish Das Lam, um, Pasuk in Zayis HaBrocha says Eish Das Lamoy. Eish Das, it's a fire law. What does Eish Das mean? It was a black fire written on a white fire. For us, symbolically, it means black ink on white parchment, but it was a fire. Black fire, dark fire, well, how can fire be dark? Be patient. We may not get to it today, probably get to it next week in the Beresha's year. The original fire that was created was created darkness. It didn't create light. At any rate, the original Torah that Maish Rabbeinu saw, Eish Chayra Agave Eish Lavana, black letters, black fire letters on white fire, there was no break in the letters. It was just letters straight across without the letters being broken down into words. It was ratsuf, letter after letter after letter after letter till the end of the Sefer Torah, no, bro- no break in the letters. As a result, the Ram- Ramban says, Voyefshe bekriyasa, shetikra al derech Hashem, vetikra al derech kriyasenu binyatur va mitzvah. And therefore, there's an infinite variety of ways to read the Sefer Torah. You can take the first letters in the Sefer Torah, Beis, Reish, Aleph, Shin, Yud, Sof, and read it Barashas. Or you can read Barosh, Yisbara. There are an infinite variety of ways how to stop and start the next word. And therefore, there's, that's what we call the Torah, and, and for one reason, Nitzchis, it's eternal. It has an infinite variety of ways for it to be read. And one of the ways, one of the ways that the Torah can be read is the way that the Rabboni Shalom told Moshe to take these letters and write it down for B'nai Yisrael. This is the Torah of Yisrael. Not that that's the only way to write those letters. Those letters can be combined into many other things. They can, can be combined into the greater secrets of the Torah, etc. 
And Moshe Rabbeinu understood these combinations. But the Rabbana Shalom said, the Torah that you're taking down to Klal Yisrael, this is where the break in each of the letters is going to be. And therefore, this is how the words will be written. And that's the Torah for Yisrael. And Moshe Rabbeinu got the Torah the way we have it with the mitzvahs. And Alpeh, orally, the Rabboni Shalom taught him how to read the whole Sefer Torah so that the Sefer Torah is only God's names. Moshe Rabbeinu was taught that by the Rabboni Shalom, how you can read the whole Sefer Torah, all the letters we have, how to read it, but it's all of God's names. And the Rabboni Shalom said, that's the Sefer Torah that you know, but the Sefer Torah you're going to give to B'nai Yisrael. This is how you break up the letters into words based on the mitzvahs, and this is what you're going to give Klal Yisrael. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to read the next paragraph quickly. It's, um, a, it's a personal message from the Ramban to those who study Ramban. And now let me answer a question to those who want to know about my Pirish al in other words, why am I writing this, basically? The Ramban's writing this about 800 years ago. What I'm going to write in the Pirish al is to sort of be meniach das, to give, to calm a person. Which people? Ha-talmidim golos. The students of Torah who are so tired of the Golas already, who are suffering in the Golas, and they're so tired and so suffering in the Golas that I'm going to write a Pirish for them that will show them the Amuna and Bitochen that's right here in the Hamisha Humshe Torah that will give them a sense of calm, a sense of relief. They'll understand how the world works. They'll understand how Kaddish Baruch runs the world as later the Ramchal wrote in Das Tavunas that we're learning. So this is a very interesting sentence to me. The Ramban says, I want to calm and relax the students of Torah who are so tired already in Golas and they're so tired of all the Tzoros 800 years ago. That read the Torah on Shabbos and Yantiv, Shabbos Shnayim Mikra Vechetagam, Velim Shachlibam Bepshatim Bukhsas Tavorim Neimim Lashon Noidim Chen. I'm going to try to draw their hearts with the beautiful, pleasant Pshatim that are in the Torah, and this will calm them and relieve them of their tiredness of the Golas and of their. Um, their suffering, and they'll have a better understanding of what they're dealing with. This is a bracha that we all get from the Ramban when we learn Ramban. And may God, so to speak, bless us, and we should find chen and seichel tov in the eyes of other men and in the eyes of God. The last paragraph of the Akdom of the Ramban is a warning. He writes that they're in different places. He's going to explain certain psukim, Alpi Kabbalah. And he doesn't want you learning those paragraphs in Ramban unless you have a Rebbe who has a, a Masorah from his Rebbe on the learning of Kabbalah. And if you have such a Rebbe, that Rebbe can teach you what I write about Kabbalah. If you don't have such a Rebbe, Skip the paragraph, the Ramban says, because trying to learn it without the proper Rebbe and the proper fundamental understanding of Kabbalah, you will be doing yourself more damage than in any way helping yourself and understand the Pasuk. Therefore, stop sign, do not go. Okay, so now we're ready to start. Let's start the first Pasuk in the Torah. And this first Pasuk in the Torah, Bereshis, Bola, Kim, Es HaShemai, Vesaris. Before we go into the first Pasuk, I just want to mention something Ramban spoke about, that the Torah is, as uh, in its original, <clears throat> black letters, a black letter fire on top of white fire. 
It just letters one after another, not broken down into any words. And the Rebbe Shalom said, I'm going to break these letters into words. This is the Torah of Klal Yisrael. This uh, explains to us <clears throat> the Medrash that we're all familiar with. We learned about in elementary school. Before Hashem gave the Torah to the Jewish people, Har Sinai, he went to Yishmael and he said, would you like the Torah? And they said, what does it say? And they said, okay, nothing doing, not interested. He went to Esau. He said, the Rosh Hashanah said, would you like the Torah? And they said, what does it say? And the Rosh Hashanah said what it said. They said, nothing doing, not interested. And so on and so forth and so forth. And the question is, it's brought down in Masech the Shabbos Andach Petas. The Kash is brought down in the Mepharshim. What Torah was the Rabboni Shalom offering Yishmael and Esau as examples? Yishmael, would you like the Torah? Esau, would you like the Torah? Nation of Yishmael, nation of Esau, would you like the Torah? What Torah exactly was he offering them? The Torah that we have in front of us? The Torah that says, I am the God that took you out of Mitzrayim. How would the nation of Yishmael or the nation of each Esau relate to that? Never happened to them. I am the God that took you out of Mitzrayim. How many times does it say in the Torah, I am the God that took you out of Mitzrayim? I believe 50 times according to Sforim. 50 times it says, I am the God that took you out of Mitzrayim. Never happened to Esau and Yishmael. What Torah was the Rabban Shalom giving to Esau and Yishmael? The answer is, there's a Torah for Esau and Yishmael that's made up of the same letters, but the letters are broken down into different words that makes the Torah a relevant Torah to the Ace of Nation. It could be a relevant Torah to the Yishmael Nation, but it's not the way our letters are broken down, the uh, way our words are broken down into Torah Yisrael, which is Moshe Emes, Ritei Emes. Okay, so that's how we understand that the Mar the Shalom was not offering Yishmael and Esau this Torah. He was offering them the Torah. And the Torah is letters, and those letters can be combined to be different messages for different nations. First passing. So I learned in Yeshiva Islam Parkway, as I mentioned. We learned in Yiddish. In Anfang, Hatar Rabbeinu Shalom, Bashafin, the Himmel and the Eir. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. What does the word in the beginning mean? What does the word voracious mean? So here we're going to have a machlokes between Rashi and the Ramban. I'm going to take a look at this next week, this machlokes. We'll see it in the Rashi and the Ramban. Rashi says that the word voracious does not mean chronological order. Voracious for Elohim does not mean the first thing that God created was heaven and earth. It can't mean that. Because let's read the Pasuk. Voracious for Elohim, In the beginning, the first thing that God created was heaven and earth. In Pasuk Beis, I have water. Who created the water? God. When did he create it? There's no mention of the creation of water. Where did the water come about? Where, where is it? When was it created? No mention of when it was created. That's an example that Rashi gives. Therefore, the word voracious, Rashi says, does not mean in the beginning, the first thing that God created was heaven and earth because we see that there was already water before the heaven and earth. So Rashi tells us voracious means lahavdo, as I give the marshal, the beginning of a novel. You're reading a novel, a half the level of our goals. Uh, the novel begins, it was late Tuesday evening in the fall of 1952, and John was crossing the street, and the light was green, and the rain was torrential. And at that time, the car came out of nowhere. And that's where the story starts. The car came out of nowhere. Until the words, the car came out of nowhere, what you have is the background information for when the story is taking place. It's in 1952 and it's at night and it's an evening and it's raining. And the story now begins with, and a car came out of nowhere. The, the earlier information is just the background for the story. 
says, Rashi says, Bereshis Borlo Kim Esa Shemayim Vesa Horetz, and the second Pasik, Bahoretz, Isa Soya, Baboyu, Bakosh of Nesom, Ruach Alakim, Machefis of Neamoyim, are really one Pasik. It's background information, and this is how you read the Psuk in Rashi says. In the beginning, when God was in the act of creating heaven and earth, earth was Tohu and Bohu and darkness on the deep water. And the spirit of God was hovering over the water. That's the background. And in this background, where the Oretz was Tohu, Vo, Choshech al Pneisam, Ruach al Kim Rechevs al Pneimayim, the story starts, Vayom al Kim Yihar, God said, Let there be light. Were there things created before God said, Let there be light? Sure, there were things created before God said, Let, said, let there be light. There was water. There are all kinds of things that we're not telling you about. God's not telling you about what he did before by Yom Rilakim Yihar. What is being said up here, Rashi says, is Bereshis Bora at the beginning when God was in the act of creating and what the place looked like was Tohu, Vo, Choshech al Pnei Sahom, Ruach al Kim Racheves al Pnei Amoyim. And with that background, and this is what the universe looks like, in the midst of all of that, Vayom al Kim Yihar, and the story of creation begins. That's how Rashi learns these Psukim. I don't remember in Yeshiva Ketana that my Rebbe explained it this way, but when you learn the Ramban, you understand that there's a very, very big difference between the way the Ramban's going to learn the Pasuk and the way Rashi's going to learn the, the Pasuk. So the old uh, idea that the first thing that God created was heaven and earth is neither true according to the Rashi and it's not true according to the Ramban. We're not going to get to the Ramban today. The Ramban is a little more complex. The Rashi says, Bereshis means in the beginning, if you're from Farish to Pasuk, Yipshutai, the Pasuk means in the beginning, when God was in the act of creating a universe and the place looked like Toyu, Voyu, Chosher Al Pnei Sohan, Baruch HaLakim, Rachem V'Sal Pnei Amoyim, and then Vayom HaLakim, the R, the R is created. But what happened before the R? Were there things here before the R? Yeah, there were things here before the R. Which things? A lot of things there were here before the R. Which? A lot of things. So why didn't God tell me about it? And none of your business. God told you what he thinks you ought to know, what you need to know for this for this purpose. That's one of the reasons why I say for Torah, uh, when you see that Hagba on Simchas Torah, the Hagba is done backwards. So you can see, first of all, the end of the Zayis HaBracha, and you can see there's a column of parchment, Le'enei Kol Yisrael, so the whole congregation can see there's nothing more written in the Sefer Torah we're not cheating you. We're not. Uh, we're not lying to you. When we start voracious, we're not hiding anything from you. We finish Lene Kol Yisrael, and then when we do the backwards uh, Hagra on voracious, you see the first letter is Bays, but there's a whole cloth. There's a whole column of empty cloth before the Bays. That empty cloth before the Bays represents a whole world of things that were created before the Bays that you don't need to know about because, as we say, I say this many times, it's none of your business. People need to learn that there are things that are none of your business. We understand that in an interpersonal relationship, the things that are none of your business. And we accept that, not to be nosy bodies. We accept the things that push not your business. In the Rabboni Shalom's creation, his Chok Matsuma, there are things push not your business, not your business either because not your business or because you couldn't understand it anyways. And, and the same you have with the first letter in the Torah. The Torah starts with a base. And there's a long medrash. Why did the Rav Shalom decide to start with a base? Why did he start with the Gimel? The Gimel said, I want to be the first letter. The Reish said, I want to be the first letter. The Dalit said, I want to be the first letter. The Aleph obviously wants to be the first letter. And the Aleph ends up being the first letter at the Aseris Adibris. Anochi Hashem Elokecha. But here, starting creation, the first letter is a base. What happened to the Aleph? It means that there are something happened before the base. And what happened before the base is an olive, and the olive's not here. It's not here because you don't even know about it. So there's all kinds of things that were created before the base and the word voracious. And that's how Rashi learns the Pasuk. 
The Torah is not giving you a chronological order here. It's in the beginning when God was in the act of creating the universe, the place, look, toyu, voyu, etc. And in that descriptive um, environment, or God said, let there be light, and creation begins from our perspective. Were things created before there? Yes. From our perspective, it starts by Yom Elokim Or. So the first Pasuk and the second Pasuk, according to Rashi, actually go together. In the beginning, when God was in the act of creating, and then the third Pasuk, Yom Elokim Or, begins the act of creating that God wants us to know about.